Welcome to Charlie Reed Crime Stories with your host, Charlie Reed. Skidmore, Missouri is a small farming town where Ken Rex McElroy was born in 1934. Rex did not finish school and actually never even made it to high school when he dropped out. He was problematic in the town, starting in his younger years, and was known very well by law enforcement in Nottoway County. On July 10, 1981, Ken McElroy was shot in the head and killed while sitting in his truck in broad daylight with about 40 to 60 witnesses on the main drag of the town. This case remains unsolved, and this is where the story begins. Through the years, Ken had a rap sheet with dozens of felonies, which included assault, child molestation, statutory rape, burglary, cattle rustling, arson, and animal cruelty. You would think with this rap sheet that how could he have been out of jail to even be killed on that fateful day in 1981? Well, this small town was not only bullied by him, which is really not descriptive enough to describe his behavior. He terrorized this town and evaded prosecution many times by intimidation. Some explanation of his behavior may be attributed to a construction site accident where a metal slab fell on him at 18 years old, but the effects of that accident can't be confirmed. Ken McElroy was about 270 pounds and stood over six feet tall. He was menacing in his nature and built a fierce reputation with the residents of the town. He would even steal cattle from local farmers and they would let it go because it was Ken, and it would be easier to deal with the theft than to deal with Ken. Over the years, he was able to avoid prosecution literally by stalking witnesses as one of his tactics, and he had a good lawyer who he told the town was also representing the mob. The police were also afraid of him, and he was always heavily armed. There are many accounts of Ken sitting in his truck for hours outside of the house of a witness to his crime or following them. Ken was indicted around 21 times, but was only convicted once. But on July 8, 1980, Ernest Bo Bowenkamp was shot by Ken at his general store. What happened previously on April 25, 1980, was a worker at the store named Evelyn Sumi asked Ken's 8-year-old daughter to return a piece of candy she had taken from the store and didn't pay for it. When her father Ken heard of the incident, he began to stalk Bo Bowenkamp and his family. On July 8, 1980, Ken drove to the alley behind the store and shot 70-year-old Bo at point-blank range in the neck. Luckily, Bo did survive the shooting. Ken McElroy was arrested and charged with attempted murder, and his preliminary trial date was set for August 18, 1980. But in his usual fashion, he started intimidating the Bowen Camp family to stop them from testifying. Bowen Camp's wife stated, quote, You can't know how intimidating it was after that. Before his trial, he'd drive up to our house in his pickup at night and just sit there. Sometimes he would fire his gun. It was frightening, end quote. Nevertheless, McElroy was able to delay the trial almost five months to June 25, 1981. According to Parade.com, quote, During this time, the acting prosecuting attorney resigned, and a new prosecutor, David Baird, was assigned the case. It is rumored that McElroy bullied the previous prosecutor to leave. Baird was only three years out of law school, but accomplished the impossible. He was able to convict McElroy of a crime. Granted, he was only convicted of second-degree assault. The jury set a maximum sentence of two years, and the judge freed him on a $40,000 bail bond pending the appeal. This is because Baird lessened the charge from attempt to kill to knowingly cause serious physical injury, end quote. So there was finally a conviction with jail time for Ken, even though the judgment wasn't perfect. However, Ken didn't stop his reckless behavior even while facing jail time. 
he quickly violated his bail by flashing his rifle and a bayonet in a local tavern called D&G, while also threatening to kill Bo Bowenkamp. He was arrested, but unfortunately, he was released rather quickly for his violation as well. On July 10, 1981, the town had a meeting at the Legion Hall, which was just down the street from the D&G Tavern. Many town residents were there, including the mayor and the sheriff, to discuss Ken McElroy and how to stop the terrorism of the town by him legally. The overall consensus was that the legal system had and was still failing them, and they needed to figure out how to stay safe from this monster. A neighborhood watch was suggested, but it seems that the people were desperately trying to exorcise a demon that wouldn't leave. As the town hall meeting continued, someone announced to the people that Ken was seen heading into the D&G tavern with his young wife, Trina. The meeting was adjourned, and about 60 people from the meeting headed down to the tavern. Some surrounded Ken's truck, while others went into the bar to wait for him to finish his drinks. Eventually, Ken comes out, his wife sits in the passenger seat, and Ken lights a cigarette, and then shots fire from the back of the truck, hitting Ken in the head and killing him on the spot. His wife, Trina, reported seeing a rifle pointed directly at Ken from the back of the truck. The events that immediately followed the killing of Ken McElroy can make this story a moral dilemma about the idea of what justice is. After McElroy was shot, no one called an ambulance for him, and there were believed to be about 45 witnesses out of the 60, and this case was never solved. His young wife, Trina, did identify a shooter, but no one else could corroborate her story, and no one else identified a shooter to this day over 40 years later. In 2019, Sundance did a documentary film on this case called No One Saw a Thing. And that title pretty much sums up the investigation and why the DA did not press charges and what the title No One Saw a Thing means for what is called vigilante justice. I can imagine the town breathed a huge sigh of relief when word of McElroy's murder spread to every nook and cranny of that town. But this case does raise questions about the justification of vigilante justice and whether it should ever be acceptable to allow citizens to take the law into their own hands. I get it, but I suspect the town moved on with their lives, not really analyzing the justice or the injustice, but just enjoyed their freedom, finally. to stop them from testifying. Bowen Quint and they needed to figure out how to stay safe from this monster. A neighborhood, hood, uh, neighbor, but this case does raise questions about the justification of, of 